question of what is mine from a few different angles. We began the first day looking at uh, the difference between Chitta and Chittasaka and talking about and practicing uh, meditations that explore that, um, uh, that duality. And we began uh, this morning looking at uh, levels of consciousness. I'm going to say a bit more about that, uh, that question. Uh, the Abhidhamma classifies consciousness into many different types, uh, 89 kinds of uh, modalities of citta, and uses various different criterion to, um, to make these divisions. One of them is primarily ethical. There are those moments that are karmically effective when we're making karma, and the chitta is associated with volition, and those can be either wholesome or unwholesome. And there are those moments when we're receiving the results of past karma, and those are either pleasant or unpleasant. And there's some kinds of uh, chitta that is neither effective nor resultant, they're known as functional. Uh, but the um, aspect I want to focus on cuts across those divisions, talking about dividing consciousness into levels. Uh, we can all know from our own experience, just from ordinary mundane experience, that consciousness is capable of being experienced in different ways. Everybody in the course of uh, one day and night experiences three quite different kinds of consciousness, it's waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Uh, so we know these are quite, uh, quite different from one another. And there are, uh, beyond that, uh, that mundane division, there is a division of consciousness into planes or levels of Pali and Bhumi means a plane or a level. So there's the Kama Bhumi, the Loka Bhumi, the Arupa Bhumi. Uh, Kama Bhumi, Rupa Bhumi, Arupa Bhumi. The three, uh, three levels, and then outside of that altogether is the Nibbana, the unconditioned, Asankata. Um, when we're thinking about these levels of consciousness, uh, it's not correct to think of um, uh, attaining jhana, for instance, as something added, something new, that something um, strange and exotic beyond the ordinary that we're uh, seeking to attain. Uh, it's really uh, an experience of a more basic, more fundamental level of mind. Uh, and it's not experienced by the ordinary mind because the mind is confused and uh, caught in the complicated web of all the experiences of the sense-desire realm. Uh, we talk about um, uh, Meditation developing jhana, uh, one of the, the teachings around that is the five nirvana, the five hindrances. There are particular defilements of mind that that cause the mind to wander and not attain this uh, singularity, the stability of, of uh, deep samadhi. And these are uh, sense desire, ill will, Sloth and torpor, anxiety and skeptical doubt. These are all characteristic of the sense desire plane. And these are the problems of the sense desire plane. 
when the mind is in jhana, it's no longer in the sense desire plane. It's now in what's known as the plane of form, the rupa loka. It's called that to distinguish it from the formless plane. And in that state of mind, the hindrances are suppressed. They're not evident. They're not uprooted or destroyed. They can still reoccur at a later time. They're not eliminated from the psyche, but they're not present at that time. The mind is experiencing a state free of those, so it's able to transcend or lift off from the sense-desire plane and realize the plane of form. And this is not a state of perfection. There are still defilements that are native to this form of existence, this form of consciousness, um, uh, such as uh, pride, uh, false view. But in particular, uh, the uh, defilements of the bhavatana and vibhavatana, the desire to exist and the desire not to exist, <coughs> These are two of the three forms of, of tanha, craving, that bind us to samsara. Sense desire craving is not present in, in uh, jhana state, in the, in the consciousness elevated to the level of form. But these other two forms of craving or desire are present. And what this means is um, that the desire to be and the desire not to be are uh, actually deeper, more fundamental defilements than the sense desire. In our ordinary existence, sense desire is probably the noisiest uh, defilement. It, it, take, it takes up the most superficial space in consciousness. It demands our attention a lot. Um, but it's relatively superficial to the, compared to these other two. That even when sense desire is made quiescent, there's still the desire to be and the desire not to be. Uh, these these are, are deeper, more fundamental uh, defilements of the mind than is sense desire. So that's one thing we can look for and experience is you know, when sense desire is, is quiescent, it's very peaceful, it's a very pleasant state of, of existence, but it's still not perfect. There's still other things happening. So we talk about uh, jhana in terms of the jhana factors. There's a, a, a way of analyzing jhana. There, there are uh, four specific states of jhana, and uh, each progressive state is simpler, more refined. There's less going on as we advance to the jhanas. The first jhana is marked by five, uh, five uh, factors, is, which, which are vitaka, vichara, sukha, piti, and ikagata. Vitaka and vichara are usually translated, as, there's various translations, but usually is something like sustained and applied thought. Um, this is the energy of uh, Vataka is the energy of striking the object, and Vichara is the object of the energy of holding the object. And these are, uh, besides being jhana factors, these are also related to the thought process and um, are the mental factors behind thinking and verbalization and, and speech. So, Vataka and Vichara are necessary for those. How uh, is the mind handling in, 
information. Um, in terms of developing meditation, it's useful to understand Vitaka and Vichara separately. So Vitaka is striking the object and Vichara is holding the object. And um, Vichara is considered the subtler factor. So you want to try and rely mostly on Vichara uh, and use Vitaka sparingly. When the mind wanders and you need to get back to the object, you, you're using Vitaka to bring the object into consciousness. And then you hold it with Vichara. Vasudhi um, Madhya compares the, as many analogies to talk about these, and one of them is striking a gong. <coughs> if you're trying to make a steady tone with the gong, you just strike it now and again to keep the tone going. And striking it is like with taka, and then the steady tone is with chara. But if you're banging it all the time, then you, don't, <coughs> you don't get a nice steady tone. You get a very a, a discordant noise. So, um, and we have these two factors of, of holding the mind. And then uh, piti and sukha are re also uh, related factors. There are two different kinds of um, uh, joy, happiness. There's different words used for them. Joy, happiness, rapture, bliss. Uh, very common piti is translated as rapture and sukha as bliss. Piti is more energetic. It's the coarser factor. It has uh, uh, very often a bodily correlate in that although it's, a men it's ultimately a mental factor, it is experienced in the body as um, in various ways, uh, uh, like spine rushes or tingles or thrills in the body of some form or another. And sukha is bliss, is this a oceanic kind of bliss, just an expansive, peaceful happiness. And there's no thrilling sensations associated with it, just a sense of deep happiness and well-being. And the, the final factor, fifth factor is ekagata, which is usually translated one-pointedness. Uh, I prefer to translate it as singleness, gone to singleness. I think it's arguable that that's, the poly compound can be analyzed by the way correctly uh, from a grammatical point of view, but I like gone to singleness or gone to unity. I prefer that because I want to get away from this sense of the mind in John as being a narrow, it's not a point at all. It's, a, it's expansive, but it's still, it's not moving. So we're looking at ekagata as the mind gone to unity. So it's, a, it's completely stable, it's locked on its object, it's not deviating from its object, which is the breath or a casina, which is a, a casina is a visual image that you might use, or any, or some, uh, some meditation uses sound. But uh, regardless what object you use, you have one object and you're stabilized on it. That's ekagata. Now, uh, first John, and there's a saying in one of the old books of, of, of first John, it says that sound is a thorn to first John. And what this means is the, the, what you have transcended the sense sphere, but, but in first John, you haven't transcended it by very much. So it's what's just outside the gate is sense experience. So if there's a loud, sharp sound, it might disturb you and you lose your jhana. Because you're then drawn, by listening to hearing the sound, you're drawn back into the realm of sense. Vitaka right? um, Vachara are still present in first jhana, so there's still some remnant of a thinking process left. At second jhana, you've gone further beyond sense <coughs> impression. But now the thorn is that which we've just left behind, which is thought process. Uh, second John is marked by only uh, three factors only of piti, sukha, and ekagata. And it's primarily marked by piti, 
PT's characteristic. So there's a feeling of um, uh, of joy and uh, <coughs> uh, ener energetic feeling, but there's no thought. One of our Ajans had a saying that uh, if you find yourself wondering, am I in second jhana, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no thought process at all in second jhana. Third jhana has left also piti behind. It's only two factor, uh, bliss, uh, sukha, and uh, ekagata. And then in fourth jhana, even bliss is left behind, is transcended, and it's equanimity and the one point in this, or singularity. So the, you can see this progression. The mind is moving always, always towards a more peaceful, more refined, a simpler, more purified state. And what uh, seems subtle, and it's the subtle and coarse are relative terms. What seems subtle at one level then begins to seem coarse and is transcended. So to begin with, an ordinary mind sense experience might seem subtle and desirable. But then as you move into jhana, it begins to seem coarse and heavy and unwanted. And it's dropped away. And then uh, thought process might seem subtle at first, but then that's becomes seen as heavy and gives course and is dropped away. And then the same with rapture and then bliss. As we at each stage we're, we're dropping away the, the most coarse aspects of experience and all remain remaining behind is the more subtle forms. The analogue of existence in those realms as Brahma gods can can thinking about that can throw some light on the nature of the jhanas. The brahmas of the first level are uh, associated with first jhana are the only ones that we have stories about and names for. Because they still have thought process, so they still do stuff. All the higher brahmas are just blissed out all the time. <laughs> so we don't we don't hear any. In, we don't hear any of them as individuals. We, they don't. They don't appear in the stories as individuals. None of them have names that we know of. Um, it's said that the most beautiful sight in the world is a first-level Brahma in his palace. The uh, most beautiful sound in the world are the uh, Brahmas of the second level that's associated with second jhana, with, with rapture, with piti, who cry aloud continually, oh, it's a go, oh, the happiness, oh, the happiness. Mm -hmm. The third level Brahmas experience the greatest happiness in, in any level of existence, and they're silent. So the, there's these um, analogs to uh, experience that can um, give us some clue as to what uh, what the state of mind we're moving towards is. And these are these are models talking about the jhanas or the Brahma levels, these are models of consciousness. And uh, it's, I would caution against becoming overly fixated on the model. Don't mistake the finger for the moon. It's, it's better to, to think in terms of this deepening samadhi. To think of it as a, as a, a continuum just trying to get deeper and deeper samadhi. And particular levels of that deepening we can call first, second, third, fourth jhana. Uh, but don't be obsessed with the labels. Just try to, if you're doing uh, samatha meditation, just always try and seek more 
stability, more stillness, more inner quiet, more spaciousness, more, more wakefulness. for us to um, consider the uh, third plane of consciousness, the formless abidings. Uh, this is beyond uh, higher than the, or uh, higher is a relative term, um, more subtle, more refined than the realm of form. In this this level of consciousness is is another step, another quantum shift. This is uh, uh, as different from the realm of form as the realm of form is from the realm of sense desire. The, fo the formless realm is mind only. You've transcended any uh, relation point to the physical body. It's a pure mind. And the beings that exist in that level have no bodies. They're just pure mind. Um, meditators experiencing the formless jhanas are at that time not uh, aware of the body. They're transcended the sense of the body. And they're experiencing a, a state uh, that uh, is pure, purely mental. This is uh, also divided into four levels. Um, there's the, to begin with, is the realm of, uh, uh, or the, the base of infinite space. Uh, then there's the realm of infinite consciousness. Then is the base of nothingness and finally the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And each one is more refined, more subtle than the last. The base of uh, boundless space still has some a uh, remnant of um, contact to materiality because it's talking about boundless space and space is a quality of, of um, <coughs> the rupa kanda, the, the base of um, uh, uh, space is, is an attribute of physicality. The other three have completely transcended even that, so they're not locatable in space. You can't say they're here or there or anywhere or nowhere. They're, just, they're not. Space is a concept that doesn't apply after the first level. So, uh, boundless consciousness is consciousness without a without a limiting factor, without a, a, a boundary. And then nothingness is, uh, is the Pali's akincha, so it's really no thingness. There's no thing to recognize there that neither perception nor non-perception is the very subtle level of consciousness when even nothingness seems too busy. <laughs> the, name is, uh, the name is meant to express the, the subtlety of it. And there's a, an interesting passage that um, tries to clarify the meaning of the name. It says that there's neither perception in the ordinary sense, but nor is it like a blank annihilation of total non-perception. And he gives uh, a couple of um, metaphors. One is uh, 
and they're both taken from monastic life. One is a uh, elder monks out on an arms round with a, a novice, and um, the novice sees up ahead there's a puddle of water, so he warns the uh, the elder monk, "Venerable sir, be careful. There's water." And the uh, the elder says, "Oh, there's water. Good. Uh, uh, fill my water flask. I can have a drink." And the the novice says, "Venerable sir, there is no water." There's enough water to wet your feet walking, but there's not enough to fill your water flask. So, and so depending on which way you look at it, it's either water or not water. Okay? Then he gives another similar metaphor. He's, um, the uh, the uh, elder asks for his alms bowl from the junior monk, and he says uh, he, he wants to put some, some lay people have given him some kanji, and he wants to put it in his bowl. And, uh, the novice says, uh, you can't, sir, there's oil in your bowl, because he oiled the bowl to keep the food from rusting. And uh, the elder says, oh, there's oil, good, uh, fill, up my, uh, fill up my oil tube, I'll, uh, I can use it for my lamp. And the novice says, venerable sir, there is no oil. So this terms of whether you know there is oil or, or water or perception or not perception are relative terms depending on how you look at it. So what I want to do for the last meditation of the of the session is a guided meditation, and I think we'll take a ten minute break before that, and um, so you can have a stretch and then. We'll go a guided meditation with the intention to give you um, a taste of this idea of the formless, formless uh, abidings. Okay. So we'll take a, we'll take about a ten minute break. <coughs> 